Hey guys, I'm really excited to be with you tonight. I'm super bummed that I'm not with you in person. Um, my son, Cooper, is turning 17 today, and so we had some birthday stuff planned uh, for him tonight that I wanted to make sure I could be a part of. Um, and I'm really bummed that this is our last week, but really I'm actually excited about some of the things that we have planned coming up for the fall for our online Bible studies. Well, right now we're planning to do both in line online and in person. And so hopefully um, we'll have those signups out within the next week or so. And you guys will be able to be planning for when we start that right after Labor Day. Listen, the other thing I want to remind you of is prayer and fasting starts on Sunday. Don't forget to be really seeking God and asking him, what do you want me to fast? Uh, how can I participate in this? If you have any questions about that, I would really encourage you to watch the sermon from Sunday because Pastor Matt talked about that um, and was really um, pretty clear and thorough about what we believe about fasting and what our goals are for this fast um, as a church. And so I would encourage you to uh, check that out. And I think the only other thing I want to announce before we get started, and Brock may have already gone over this, but be sure to sign up for church, for church this Sunday. Uh, if you're signing up for an inside seat, we do have uh, six weeks up to four years old kids ministry starting this weekend. If you're still feeling uncomfortable, we are always, we're still online, but we also have the outdoor overflow uh, that we're going to try out this weekend, see how it works. We're going to make adjustments and kind of keep going as we can, but just make sure you bring a chair. Okay. So it's all going to be a live feed out to the parking lot. And so that's going to be pretty cool. Uh, but listen, guys, we're excited about today. I'm so looking forward to teaching our last name of God that we're going to do. Not there, I didn't cover them all, right? Okay. Uh, but this is the last one that we're going to do. And this one, I think, is a really great one to end on. And I'll tell you why in just a minute, okay? So today, we're going to be talking about... Oh, last thing real quick. Be sure you check out the notes. Brock has a link for that. You can pull it up and because I'm going to give you a lot of scripture today. So get your, get your notes, get your pen, get your Bible, get all that stuff ready to go. Um, and we're going to dive into the name El Shaddai. It's S-H-A-D-D-A-I. And uh, I've got my notes over here, so I'm going to be looking at those two while I'm teaching. But um, El Shaddai, okay? This is an exciting name for me, uh, especially to end our study with, because this is a covenant name of God. And if you've been around at all, you know that I love talking about the covenant. And it's a name used when God made covenant with Abram, okay, who later becomes Abraham, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. But it's the perfect name to end because it leads us into our next Bible study. So in September, when we start our Bible studies up, I'm actually going to be teaching a Bible study about the covenant. It's a precept, which you guys have heard me talk about before, but we're going to be doing a covenant study. I love teaching about it. I'm really passionate. I think it's such great information for everybody to know about. Um, just as believers, we get a basis of the foundation of our faith and it's amazing. Okay. So the name El Shaddai actually means the Lord Almighty, the most powerful, okay? So this is like a really powerful name. Some of us remember, this is aging us a little bit, but there was a song uh, back in the 80s called El Shaddai, and it was very beautiful and soft and slow. That's not what this name is about, okay? This name is the Almighty, the All-Powerful, okay? Let's just let that sink in for just a minute, okay? The Lord El creator God, right? The most powerful, the almighty. And the word almighty actually means to have complete power, complete power, all the power, right? That's it. There's literally nothing greater than God. Can our minds even comprehend his greatness, right? It's just too much. When we think about how great he is, how much power he has, how much he's willing to do for us, it really makes me feel, especially just humbled at the thought of what God's willing to do. And so here's what we're going to focus on today is the promises that God established with us because he will be faithful to do it. And here's the key with what we're going to talk about today, even without our help. And that's hard because sometimes we want to jump in and help God out a little bit, don't we? Okay, so we're going to start out in Genesis 17. This is where we see the name El Shaddai. Verses 1 and 2, it says this. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. I will make a covenant with you by which I will guarantee you 
to give you countless descendants, okay? Let me flash back here to the beginning of this. Abram was 99 years old, and God is promising countless descendants, right? If it were in our terms, we'd be saying, hey, look, this isn't possible. Your clock is ticking, right? It's ticked out. Everything is not lining up with what we're seeing, with what you're saying, God. But God introduces himself and to us in this passage as El Shaddai, and it's in the context of covenant. This covenant is a formal, official agreement that God makes with Abram, okay? And ultimately, he makes with us. And if you've ever trusted in Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, okay, which I hope you all have, um, if you haven't, please make sure you let your, uh, your small group leader know that here in a few minutes. But if, you, if, if we've entered into what we call the new covenant with Jesus, when we become saved, okay? And Jesus spoke about this when he instituted communion and the Lord's Supper. He talks about ushering in the new covenant. That's what happened when Jesus died on the cross. The veil was torn. Everyone had access to his presence. Everybody had access to the Holy Spirit. And in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five, 25, Paul says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. Jesus ushered in a new covenant, okay? So the covenant he instituted with Abram was the old covenant that instituted the new covenant with Jesus and his death on his cross. The fact that El Shaddai is introduced to us in the context of God's covenant is no small thing because God takes covenant seriously. That's why he takes marriage seriously, right? That's why he takes relationships seriously because it's in the context of covenant. And it's very important to remember that as we continue to explore this name, because God originally introduced this covenant to Abram, not in Genesis 17, but 25 years earlier in Genesis 12. And this is when God established the agreement or the original covenant. So I want to read this to you because I think it's important. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. This was the original institution of the covenant. The Lord said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on the earth will be blessed through you. Okay, this is, this is the covenant. But listen, all the families on the earth will be blessed through this covenant with Abraham. Guess what? You are included in all. This was talking about Jesus, about the new covenant, about all the things that happened after he originally set this up. In Genesis, Genesis 12, God had a plan all along. I love that. I love it so much that God had a plan to bring us in, to include us from the time of Genesis, okay, from the very beginning. And he first gave Abram this agreement. This happened when Abram was 75 years old. He told them that you're going to have descendants. You're going to be blessed. All the nations of the world will be blessed through you. Because God's covenant always involves blessing, okay? Now, some people don't like to think about that. Um, it, it, there's some different things, but I want to just break that down just a little bit. What does blessing, what is a blessing, okay? A blessing is God's favor expressed first to you and then through you, okay? So it's God's favor. What is favor? Unmerited grace. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You can't get it. He just gives it to us because he loves us, okay? That's what a blessing is. So think about salvation, right? It's a blessing to us, and it's a blessing through us, okay? Number two, it brings God glory. Blessings from God bring God glory. They don't bring us glory. They don't glorify man. They bring glory to God. And number three, blessings are generational. And we see that here with Abram is that he's not only talking about blessing Abram, but he's talking about blessing Abram's descendants, okay, who become the Jews, the Israelites, okay, that we've been talking about a lot in the study. But he's talking about a generational blessing. That's amazing, right? And we're actually talking about this in the fast coming up is that we want to pray for not only for ourselves and for our kids, but for our grandkids and our great grandkids and that God's blessing would flow through us to generations to come, that they would live upright before God that they would live a life that's pleasing to him, okay? So when God told Abram he was gonna bless him, it wasn't just a promise to bring good things to Abram, but he said he would do it and that he would make him a great nation so that all the families of the earth would be blessed, okay? Uh, okay, so just like us, 
Abram grew tired of waiting, okay? We all grow tired of waiting on God to do what he said he would do, right? And he began to question God in Genesis 15. He's like, hey, the clock's ticking. What's going on? Are we doing this thing or not? I mean, you can just imagine the questions that are going on in Abram's mind as he's aging and he's watching his wife age. And he's like starting to question if he really believes what God said, that God would do what he said he would do, okay? And so what he does, which is what many of us do, is he took it a step further and decided to come up with his own plan. And just like most of us would do, he made a mess. And in Genesis 16, we see that he ended up sleeping with his wife, Sarah's maid, Hagar, and she ends up getting pregnant. And he then has this illegitimate heir named Ishmael. And this is interesting about Ishmael. He actually um, became the father of the Arab nation, okay? And so unless you've been living... Uh, under a rock or you're not paying attention to current events, which I'm myself guilty of very often, but you know that the Arab nation has been in conflict with the Jews ever since then until this day. Okay. So this was significant. Abram didn't just mess things up for his heir, but he really, um, by taking these matters into his own, own hands and by trying to help God out really made a mess. Okay. But then in the very next chapter, God introduces himself as El Shaddai. And it's kind of like him saying, hey, I've got this. I don't actually need your help. I'm the almighty God and I can handle this on my own, right? 25 years after the promise was first given and both Sarah and Abram had become extremely old, weary of waiting and tired in the promise, okay? They tried their own methods, but nothing good had come out of it. And in fact, they really became uh, frustrated. And I, I can imagine they started assuming that God had abandoned his promise. So many of you listening to this right now have situations in your life where you haven't seen God come through the way that you thought he would. And you have assumed that God abandoned his promise. But I'm here to tell you tonight, if you don't get anything else about out of this, God never abandons his promises. God is faithful to do what he said he would do. Even when you can't see it, even when it doesn't make sense, even when it looks like you are waiting, 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 God is faithful. Two, I'm sorry, maybe you feel like he's been taking too long to fix your marriage, to bring salvation to one of your kids, to help you in your career, or to give you some other kind of breakthrough. Listen, all of us have felt that at some point or another, okay? It is in those times that God reminds us of who he is. At Abram's moment of deepest doubt, God told him that his name was El Shaddai. In his moment of greatest frustration, when he'd gone about his own thing, when he'd done it, we would think that that would bring punishment and judgment from God, but it didn't. God graciously revealed a new name, even in this dark place. And as you recall, El is the singular form of Elohim, which we talked about in week one. This was the name God gave us in Genesis 1-1, that God reveals himself as the all-powerful creator. And the next word, Shaddai, comes from the root word Shad, okay, S-H-A-D, which literally means breast. And I want to I wanna frame this up for you, okay? In Isaiah 60, verse 16, it says, Powerful kings and mighty nations will satisfy your every need as though you were a child nursing at the breast of a queen. You will know at last that I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Israel. And then in Isaiah 66, it says this in verses 10 through 11, rejoice with Jerusalem, be glad with her, all you who love her and all you who mourn for her, drink deeply of her glory, even as an infant drinks at its mother's comforting breasts. Okay, so the name El Shaddai, when coupled together, literally gives us the image of God supplying the nourishment needed to sustain life. Okay, he's all that we need. This is one of the most powerful images we can have of God. He's the almighty, all powerful. Nothing is too big for him. Anything, he can do anything kind of God. And he loves you and he chose you and he wants to be in relationship with you. Let that sink in a little bit. The almighty, all powerful creator God chose you, loves you, wants relationship with you, wants to meet all your needs, wants to be your uh, shoulder to cry on, right? Your person that you go to when you need something, he is interested in your life. When we are lacking anything, the, any need that we have, the Almighty can come through for us. 
I want you to think of those moments that you have felt your inability to produce what God has promised you. Okay, so if God's promised you that you would have a, a family, right? And, and you've tried everything in your power to have a family and it's just not happening. Listen, I want to tell you something. God can produce in you and through you what he's promised. He doesn't even need your help. He can do what he said he would do. He will do it. He's faithful to do it. When we have a word that he's given us that we can stand on, we can trust and rely that he will do every single thing that he said he would do, okay? And, and we can often wonder, like, how can God work it out in me? I have so little to offer. I have nothing to offer him. But this is when God reminds us, he reminds you and me that he is the creator and he can literally create something out of nothing and then he can sustain it. He can sustain life. He creates it and then he sustains it. Hebrews 11.3 says, by faith we understand, by faith, what is faith? It's the evidence of what we cannot see, right? It's, it's the substance of what we can't see. It says, by faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command, that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. What we now see in front of us didn't come from anything that can be seen. He is El Shaddai and he will work it out. You don't have to figure it out. God's got it just like he did with Abraham and Sarah. He doesn't need your help. He doesn't need, the, he didn't need their help and he doesn't need your help. Okay. I love you. You're my favorite people. Just remember God doesn't need your help, right? He needs you to be obedient. He needs you to come in alignment with him. He needs your surrender. But once we surrender to him and we are obedient to what he says, God can do it. He can do it in ways you cannot even imagine. Okay. So God would do everything and will do everything that he said that he would do because he's faithful to his promises and because he's faithful to the covenant that he made with Abram and the covenant that he made with us through Jesus, okay? God has the power to bring into the visible, physical realm everything that exists in the invisible realm. So everything that's going on in the spirit, everything that we experience, everything that we know, God can bring that to pass in the natural, right? He can bring healing. He can bring favor. He can bring deliverance. He can bring all those things from the spirit to the natural. He doesn't need anything to work with, right? He created the heavens and the earth, listen, out of nothing. He created them out of nothing. He can create in your life out of nothing, okay? He certainly did not need Abraham and Sarah's help, right? They just messed it up. He is both the creator and the sustainer of life. Write that down. God is both the creator and the sustainer of life. And he loves, he loves to manifest himself in the context of the impossible. If you see a, a situation that's impossible, that's where he wants to show up. If it looks like you can't figure it out, if it looks like you're never going to be able to get an understanding and, and make it happen, that's when God wants to show up. He loves to show off in the context of the impossible. Okay. So Abram receives this revelation of God in his name, El Shaddai. And this is the time when he chooses to fall on his face before God and surrender. Why? Because he had just messed up. What happens when we mess up? What happens? When we choose to fall on our face before God, he comes in as the almighty God and cleans up our mess, cleans up what we have going on. He fixes the situation. He comes in to help us, give aid to us. I keep going back to the scripture last week that we talked about um, I believe Jesus said it he, before he died, before he was crucified. He said not to take us out of the world, but to keep us safe in the world, right? I think that's a significant verse for us right now in this season that we're in. He's the almighty God. No matter what we messed up last week, God is faithful to come in and bring peace and sustain us, to create something out of nothing, to create life, to create peace, to create uh, joy where we have none, right? God can do it when we align ourselves to him, okay? And he doesn't stop there. This is such a cool piece of covenant that God actually redeems Abram by giving him a new name, okay? So I want to talk about this. I want to, I want to do it in the context of the scripture, though. So in Genesis 17, 4 through 5, it says this. This is my covenant with you. God's talking to Abram. I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. Remember, he's 99, okay? He has no kids, no heirs. What's more, I'm changing your name. It will no longer be Abram. Instead, 
you will be called Abraham, for you will father many nations. Keep in mind, remember, he's 99. They haven't been able to conceive, but God goes ahead and changes his name and gives him a new name, which literally means exalted father. God changed his name to fit the promise. You see, God doesn't see us according to our past. God doesn't call us according to our mistakes. He calls us according to our future. He calls us according to our purpose and our potential. So I just, there's some bits and pieces of this in the devotional for this week that I think could be really powerful. But a lot of us have been called certain things. We've been uh, living in this past life where we've been adapting to our old way of thinking or uh, I think that I'm uh, a failure. So I live my life calling myself a failure, but God's saying, you're not a failure because I see success in your future. And I'm going to call you out based on what's ahead and not what's behind. So I really encourage you to dig into that devotional this week, because I think God wants to process some things with us about stuff we've been believing about our past. That's not true about our future. Okay. So in Abraham's culture, more than ours, names defined people, okay? So people name their kids any old thing any, nowadays. I mean, it's crazy, right? Okay. But some people don't, obviously. Give your kids good names, right? Pray about it. Get some insight in what God wants to name them. But Abraham, God wanted to Abraham know to know who he truly was by giving him a new name for God, but also a new name for him, okay? He wanted him to be reminded. Every time somebody spoke his name, they began to say, exalted father, and they began to declare the truth of who he was. This is significant, guys. If we can begin to declare the truth of who we are, to begin to declare the truth about what God says us, sees in us and says about us, things will shift. We'll begin to see ourselves differently, and God will bring it about when we declare truth, okay? So what does this have to do? How do we, how do we go from knowing that he's the almighty God to implementing that in our life, okay? What does that look like? So I want to talk about our access to the Almighty for a minute, okay? In Psalm 91, this is one of my favorite verses, and we see in the first two verses four names of God. So I'm going to read this, okay? He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty, or the Shaddai. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Abide in the shadow. Listen, in essence, it's all about where you hang out. If you dwell where God dwells, in the shelter of the Most High, he'll do his thing in your life. If you dwell where he dwells, if you abide where he lives, he'll be the Almighty God, your El Shaddai, when we invite him in, when we dwell with him, when we stay put, when we hang out with him, okay? If you dwell and you live where he's at, are you living where God's at? Are you living in the shadow of his presence, right? I love that in the shelter, in the shadow, when we dwell where he dwells, we abide in him and he begins to shape and change and have access to move us. This thing is not just a Sunday thing, guys. It can't just be something we do every now and again. This has got to become the way that we live. Why am I saying that? Why? Because this thing matters. It matters how much you love God. It matters how you live your life. It matters how you come into connection with him and have relationship with him. It matters because he created you because he designed you, because he has a purpose and a plan for your life. And when we come into agreement with him and we abide in him and we dwell in him, he can create something out of nothing in your life. That's a big deal. And it's amazing to think that the almighty, most high, all powerful God wants one thing from you and it's your heart. He longs to remain with you. This is an incredible thought. And Jesus reminds us of this in John chapter 15, verses five through seven. He says this, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me or dwell or abide with me is thrown away like a useless branch that withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. Verse 7. But if you remain in me, if you dwell and you abide and you hang out and you spend time, my words will remain in you. You may ask anything you want and it will be granted. Why? Because we're one in the spirit with God in that moment. 
We're asking according to his will. We understand what he has for us. We understand the purpose of who he's called us to be. And remember what Pastor Matt talked about on Sunday. This isn't like a, I want a new car. I want a new house. This is like, God, what do you have for me? I want a pure heart. I want to operate in a spirit of wisdom. I want your favor in my job so that I can reach the lost. I want, I want to speak in a way where people receive what you're saying through me. God, I want to be full of your spirit so that people are impacted by my words and by my life. That's what the things that we begin to ask for when we're abiding with him, when we're remaining in him. That's what we can ask for and declare by faith, okay? When we're with God, abiding, walking with him, there's nothing he won't do for us. He moves on your behalf because of covenant, because of the new covenant. Because if we are Christians and we call ourselves Christians or a lot of Christians are trying to live by their own decisions, your own will, your own choices, and that's causing damage in your soul, it's causing a lot of waiting, and it's creating a lot of detours for your purpose. When you're trying to do things your own way, it creates detours for your purpose. God is saying, hand me the keys, right? I know how to take you exactly where I want you to go, but you've got to give me control, right? Okay, so this is kind of lame, but Carrie Underwood sang a song, Jesus, take the wheel. No, Jesus, take the car. Sit in the driver's seat. Take the keys away from me. Hide the keys. Don't give them back. I don't want them back. Do what you need to do in me through my life so that I can do what you've called me to do. He is powerful enough, El Shaddai, to supply all of our needs, regardless of what we can see, okay? This is the message of the gospel. God's word doesn't automatically and immediately change all of life's negative realities. Let that sink in. The gospel isn't a quick fix. It's not, it is a rescue of your soul, but it's not a quick fix to your life. This is something that we have to take and apply and dwell in God's presence, okay? Christians, we still face the same troubles that other people do. I mean, look around. Christian-owned businesses are struggling right now. Christian people are getting sick. Christian people are losing loved ones. Christians are struggling. They're hurting just like everybody else. But God provides a sustaining hope that will fulfill his promises. We have hope. That's what sets us apart. That's what makes us different is we have hope in him. The Bible says in Colossians 1, 27, I think, that the hope of his glory, guess where it is? It's in you. We are the hope that the world needs right now. When we abide in him and when we dwell in the almighty, he will make a way, okay? Because he provides a sustaining hope to fulfill his promises. He's always aware of your situation. He's always working on your behalf, even when you can't see it, working to do what's good working out the hard things to bring himself glory so that you'll be blessed and blessing can flow through you regardless of how dark or how difficult your situation is, how long you've waited. We've got to keep our faith in God. Trust him because he is truth. We can, tr you can't trust anything right now. I'm just going to say that. Okay. We don't know what's true. Here's what's true. The word of God. And here's where we can put our trust in him. We can put our trust in him because we know that his word is truth. That's what you can write a check on it, take it to the bank. It is good, good, good. The word of God is truth. It's powerful. It's for today. It's living. It's powerful. It's active. It is access to the unseen realm. What does that mean? What are you talking about? It's the spirit of life. It's the spirit of truth. It's the spirit of peace. It's the spirit of joy. When we abide in him, we those things become real in our lives, okay? He is the almighty God who sustains us. So when the day that you see that promise fulfilled, you can praise him because what seemed like a hopeless situation, God turned it around for his glory and for your blessing, okay? So we saw Abram in this hopeless situation, but he and Sarah continued to believe in Romans 4, 18, it says, against all hope, Abraham believed in hope. He ultimately saw the fruit of God's promise to him when his son was born because God will be faithful to do what he promised. It may be something you can see. It may be something that happens for you or it may happen for your kids because remember, blessings are generational. It may be something you see uh, in your own life or in the life of your family or in the life of generations to come. That's not for us to determine. What is for us to determine is that we trust God, that we believe his word and we know him to be true, right? So here's what I want you to walk away from this, from this study. You can trust God. You can trust him. You can, you can be confident in him. 
so I was just praying today and, and feeling a little heavy and a little burdened and just a little bit um, stressed out. If I'm being honest, I was feeling really anxious today um, about a few situations. And my mom bought me this framed picture when I must have been 16 or 17 years old. So a few years back. Okay. But I've had it on my dresser ever since. And it's just this little framed picture. And it says, Carrie, trust me, I've got everything under control. Jesus. And every time I start to feel anxious, every time I pray, I say, God, I'm I'm feeling overwhelmed. I hear that immediately. Every time, Carrie, trust me, I've got everything under control. Okay. I trust you. You're El Shaddai. You're the almighty God. You're the all powerful God. You see where I can't see you go where I can't go. And I'm going to trust that you've got this under control. And I want you to, I want you to remember that today, wherever you're at, whatever situation you're in, God is in control. I wanted to share this with you because I think this has been such a powerful teaching. I'm excited for the upcoming Bible studies we have. I think that people are desperately hungry for the word of God right now, for truth and for foundation. So we're going to do that. We're going to continue to build on this foundation. But if you're interested in learning more about the names of God, this was the resource that I used. It's um, Tony Evans. It's the power of God's names. That might be backwards in the video, but uh, it's by uh, Pastor Tony Evans. And it's really powerful. There's more names that he goes over, more things that he discusses. It's a really great resource that you can order right on Amazon. So I would encourage you to get it if you're interested in learning more about the names of God um, so that you can continue to dig in. Listen, guys, go back through this. Watch the videos. If you didn't do the devotional, I encourage you to work through the devotional and get signed up. Be at church. Be present online. Be with us. Don't isolate. Don't shrink back. Lean into what God's doing. Lean into what he's saying. Continue to grow in your faith because when we do, when we dwell in his presence, remember his almighty power shows up and shows off in our life. Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you, God, that you are ministering in us. You're ministering through us, God. And I pray that your power would be greater in our weakness, God. We just surrender to you fresh and anew, God. I pray that we would trust you with our whole hearts, In every area of our lives, God, we just surrender it to you today. I pray that you would be with us as we continue on in our groups, that you would help us to be vulnerable, open, and honest, and that we would hear your voice in a clear, real, and powerful way. In Jesus' name, amen.